Hey, hey y'all, it is Sheeta D, and today I'm giving you the scoop of how I retired at 39, even though that wasn't my plan. So I was watching YouTube the other day, and I saw a video from a channel called Our Rich Journey, and they talked about how they retired early at 39 um, using the FIRE method, which means financial independence retire early. And I used FIRE before I knew it was FIRE. <laughs> to retire early, but I kind of got there accidentally. And I'm gonna tell you the story of how. This is gonna sound strange to say, but I frequently forget that I retired at 39. And it's because it wasn't my goal. In my early 30s, I set a goal, I wrote on my calendar, cause I'm a total planner like that. I wrote on my calendar for my 40th birthday that I was going to retire from my standard corporate job. On my 40th birthday, I found it when I turned 40, cause the reminder popped up and I was like, Oh, I did that a year ago. I didn't plan on it, but that's what happened. The events that led up to my retirement aren't like what led to most people's retirement. But here's the scoop. This company I worked for went out of business about a month before my 39th birthday. Um, I was a lawyer. I'd been working as a lawyer for over a decade and I had paid off about $200,000 worth of student loan debt. So I was going to be a lawyer forever, forever, because I had paid for it. I had bled for it. If you know my toxic workplace stories, you know I worked for it. And so when they went out of business, my plan, um, the plan that came up was that I was going to travel the world for a year, which I did. And then while I was traveling the world, I was like, clock into a job? answer to a boss I don't see it for myself I don't see it for myself and that's when I decided to start calling myself retired and then I realized I might as well backdate it to like 2018 when I got laid off and so I guess technically I retired at 38 but I say 39 because it's just it makes more sense so yes so I didn't plan on retiring I also didn't plan on taking a career break. I also didn't plan on getting laid off, let's be real. <laughs> like, I did not plan on that. Um, but when I got laid off, I looked at the money I had saved and I was like, oh, I can afford to travel for a year. And then when I realized I didn't want to go back to work, I did some math real quick and I was like, oh, I can retire. So let's talk about how I got there. So I got to early retirement without actually um, having that as a plan I was working. It was a goal, but it, it always felt like when I wrote it in my early 30s, it felt like a goal that was like a pipe dream. Like if I hit the lotto kind of a thing, like I, I want to retire by 40, but like people don't do that. So that's not really gonna happen for me. But I thought the same thing about traveling the world. I felt the exact same way. Like people don't actually do that. Like I want to, I see, I see like, people who don't look like me doing that and I want to do it, but like, that's not realistic. All of these things happened for me because of how I handled the money I had after I got laid off in 2009. Side note, if you want to travel the world as well, if you want to quit that job, quit that job. If you want to quit that job and travel the world, you can too. I have a sabbatical planning guide in, I'll link to it in the description. Um, get that. It's going to give you the first 10 steps you need to plan to quit your job, travel the world, or take a break from your job and come back to them if you want to. You're not going to want to. You're not going to want to come back to them. But if that's what you want to do, um, I have a guide that will tell you how to do it. It's free. I'm linking to it in the description. Go ahead and grab that and get all the info you need to take a trip around the world. Travel. I know it's a pandemic. Ain't nobody going nowhere right now. But I tell people that you can do this in a year. If you want to quit your job and travel the world, give yourself a year and you'll be able to do it. Look at the guide, look at the other resources I provide below and you, will, you too will be able to do it. All right, so I'm gonna walk you through the steps that our rich journey took to retire at 39 because they were very intentional about it. And I'm gonna walk you through the steps that I took to retire at 39 because I was intentional about my money even if retiring wasn't the goal, I was still very cautious and intentional with my money. So let's, let's get to it. 
If you're unfamiliar with our rich journey, it's their family of four that retired to Portugal as millionaires, um, two adults, two kids. Cute little family, go check them out. Their first step was to save 70% of their income. That's a lot of money, y'all. Uh, well, it's a high percentage. Um, I probably saved 30 to 50% of my income when I, when I stopped, when, after I paid off my debt. That is probably the amount that I saved. 70 kind of blows my mind. Maybe I did it a month or two, I don't know, but hearing them say they saved 70% of their, their money over a very long period is amazing and impressive. Um, I saved a lot after I paid off all my debt, um, but I, I don't think it was 70%. The second step they took was they cut their housing costs out by buying houses and living in them and flipping them. So they would buy a house, flip the house, use that money to buy another house and flip the house. And so they were always making money in the houses they lived in. And it was like a slow flip. So they lived in it and fixed things as they go. Um, they were making money in the houses they lived in instead of uh, having it be an expense for them. Me. I flipped one house and was like, this is not for sis. Flipping houses is not for me. I did it once with my mom. The house was super, super cheap. When I say cheap, I think I, we bought it for like $17,000. I don't remember how much we put into fixing it, but it wasn't even the expense, the effort that I had to put in to keeping on top of the general contractor to make sure shit got done, it's not for me. It's not, for, I will tell you that as far as watching my money grow, I wanna be as lazy as possible. Let me put it in some index funds, let me, let me watch it grow there. I am, we'll talk more about that in a minute. I am not the one to be actively chasing money in individual stocks or, or real estate investing that requires actual work. Lazy girl me, give me the lazy girl method. I'm not, I'm not, it's not for me. But I did eliminate my housing expenses by, pay, I, okay, so perfectly transparent here. When I moved to Columbus, Ohio after law school, um, I was looking at houses with a realtor and the realtor got a letter. Uh, the bank said the, the realtor what my uh, approval amount was and it was like, five times or maybe four times the amount of the houses I was actually looking at. And she was like, don't do it girl. Don't buy a house that expensive. Like you, you're approved for this much. Mind you, I had not worked a day as a lawyer yet. The bank was just like, oh, you gonna be a lawyer? <laughs> Take this money and pay us back forever. The banks are there to get you in debt. Debt does not serve you. It can if you're very, very strategic about it, but for most people, debt does not, most Americans, I would say like 95%, debt does not serve you. And so um, I got great advice from her to be like, yes, I'm approved for this much, but no, I'm not going to get that much. So the house I bought was uh, $84,000 in 2006, and I put down 20%, uh, and so my mortgage was $67,000. Um, the house was cute. It was a three bedroom house in Columbus, Ohio. It was hood adjacent. Uh, all of my friends had like large, beautiful, like McMansions. All of my coworkers were like, you live where? But they had mortgages and your girl paid off her mortgage in like eight or nine years. So my mortgage was paid off now, it was paid off Nine years would be 2017. It was paid off before that. It was probably paid off by like 2015, I think. Um, I paid it off pretty quickly by, um, once I paid off my credit cards, and I, I got a HELOC. I did a lot of bad financial things early on. Um, I paid off my, my home equity line, which I took out to pay off credit cards at the advice of a financial planner who did not have my best interest at heart. Another story for another day. But I paid off my credit cards, I paid off my HELOC, um, I started paying double and sometimes triple payments on my mortgage, which was $600 when I had PMI and lower than that, maybe 
buy something for something when I when the PMI went away. Um, and so yeah, so I paid them all the extra money I could and paid it off. So for the last uh, maybe five years I lived in that house, maybe, maybe less, maybe three or four, I did not have a mortgage. I also didn't have a car payment. Now this is one of those flukes. I, uh, I moved to Columbus, I had a car that I had owned for years. Drove that bitch until the wheels fell off. I took it to a, it wouldn't start. I called the mechanic, he came over and he was like, you could fix this car. <laughs> or you could just go buy a new one. He's like, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. And so I bought a new car. Um, and when I, I bought a used car in 2009. I think I bought a 2003 Audi, but it was like my little luxury car. Um, and then I started working soon after I started working for a car company and they let me use their cars. And so I didn't have uh, car payments. Um, after I left the car company, so I was there for eight years. That sounds about right. So eight years, no car payment. Then I, after I left the car company, I started looking at buying a car and looking at car payments. And I was like, who, who won't pay for that? I gotta pay how much month? So I have not owned a car since that Audi in 2009. I, um, I tra public transportation, I use Uber, I do a lot of different things, but I have not owned a car, I have not paid for car insurance. Um, after I got spoiled of not having a car payment and then seeing what they were, I was like, no ma'am, I have never bought a new car. I don't see myself buying a new car in this lifetime. I live in Mexico City now where I couldn't even imagine driving a car because traffic here is insane. Um, and I want to be free to travel the world. And some of that means putting down the things that weigh you down and things like cars and homes, they can weigh you down. So no more of that for me. So yes, so I cut down my expenses, not having a car payment, not having a house payment by buying a super, not a super cheap house because $84,000 isn't super cheap, but compared to what everyone else I knew was doing, it was super cheap, paid it off quickly, and then moved on to my other financial priorities. Okay, our rich journey's third step was to invest all of their money into index funds and into house flipping. I told her already, house flipping, not for me, but I coincidentally do, um, that is what I give my money to. I, after I paid off debt, I had a good savings cushion, I put all of my money into, I had a money market account at Vanguard that I opened about 15 years ago that I had pennies. I think I had a thousand dollars in there for like five years. But when I, when my money stopped going to debt servicing and it stopped going to like building a comfortable savings cushion, I started putting more money in there. And the money that I put into my Vanguard accounts into those index funds has grown exponentially over the past uh, maybe 10 years, maybe no, maybe less, eight years or so that I've really started putting money in there. And that's after how I fund, funded my trip around the world. It's how I fund my life now. Um, the money grows every month. The money grows every month more than I spend every month. And so I don't actually need an income because the money I get from my um, investment accounts takes care of me. Also, because I live cheaply, but we'll talk about that again in a minute. Our rich journey's fourth step to becoming financially independent and retiring early was to side hustle. You may have already picked up on this. Side hustling is not for me. Um, I don't, I'm a lady of leisure. I don't want to work more than I have to. I just, I had a stressful job. It took everything out of me. I don't want to do shit else. Like, this is it for me. I don't, I don't want to have to do more to earn, to stress about earning more money. I want to live a leisurely, easy life. So no side hustling for me. I did become a yoga teacher while I was a lawyer. I, um, if you know any yoga teachers, you know, we don't do it for the money because the pay, the pay is not all that. Um, but I did do it because I wanted something else. I was burned out. I felt like I needed something else. And so I started, te started teaching yoga. Um, it was great. It was a great experience for me. 
it was not it was not a side I didn't consider it a side hustle I created I considered it something I did because I loved the yoga community in the city I lived in and it was an, a place for me to focus my energy that was not the job that was burning me out okay the fifth and last step that our rich journey talks about is creating a pay yourself first budget and in their pay yourself first budget they put money towards investment first so when they got paid they took out their investment money and put that in their investments as the first step that they did i can do that i kind of invested i think i invested what i had left over after i paid for my life but um from 2009 when i got laid off during the recession which really is what changed my money story my money tra trajectory because i was unemployed for six months and I was like in the dark in that cheap house where the mortgage was only $600, worried that one of these days I wasn't gonna have the $600 to pay off that mortgage. And so that is when I really started, I got a tight budget. If it wasn't in my budget, I wasn't paying for it. I started using Mint to track my expenses and to budget um, and it really got me in shape. And I used a really, really tight budget. I used to look at my bank statement every day. Like, how much money is in this? Okay, I know. How much every day? Um, that was from like 2009 to 2015. I really tightly budgeted. After 2015, I'd been doing it for so long that I didn't really have to focus so much on the budgeting because it was kind of ingrained in me. I still had a budget, but I kind of knew like, this is how much money I'm taking in. This is how much money is going to investments but so much money is going to savings. I have that figured out. Um, but my priorities in order were paying off debt, saving some cushion, and then investing in those mutual funds. Um, there are other things along the way, like getting the match from my 401k, from a company match, my 401k and everything. But um, that's kind of the trajectory of what I did. Okay, now let's get to the good part. Our Rich Journey shared their FIRE number. And if you don't know, the FIRE number is the Financial Independence Retirement number that people use to figure out if they have enough savings to retire early. And the way people look at it is if you use 4% of the money you have each year, the if you have investments, the investments will increase by more than 4%, so you'll always have enough money to live on for the rest of your life. So the way they figured it out was they took their annual retirement expenses and multiplied by 25. And that number was their retirement number. It was their fire number. Now, they don't give you their number, but their number was a seven-figure number. And they retired to Portugal with that seven-figure number and their family of four. Now, when I, I told you, I kind of went at it backwards. I looked at how much money I have and said like, okay, I'm retired. Now, when I looked at that number, it was a six figure number. I did the math and I was like, if I don't live in the United States, if I don't retire in the United States, this is enough money. And so I used that number to say, okay, I've hit fire. Like I just looked at my number and I was like, sure, why not? Fire, done. Um, and since then, that six-figure number has grown to a seven-figure number. Um, I've never actually said that out loud on the internet before, so yay. Um, it is a seven-figure number. Uh, I am comfortable at, I'm 41 now, I think. Yes, 41. Um, and I am comfortable saying that the money I have now barring any kind of stock market wipeout, uh, barring, <laughs> barring a worst case scenario, uh, the money I have now will last me for the rest of my life. Now that I decided to retire, now is where I got very intentional. I live in Mexico City. Um, I live in Mexico City because it's truly my favorite city in the world. It is where I want to be, but it also has a significantly lower cost of living than most American cities. Um, it's not the cheapest city in Mexico. If I wanted to live somewhere cheaper, there are a this is what probably the mo one of the most expensive cities in Mexico to live in, um, but it's my fave, so I'm here because, you know, treat yourself. So I went to the Earth Awaits, and I want to run an example for you guys. I went to the Earth Awaits to get the uh, cost of living for one person in Mexico City, 
and that is $1,200 a month. So um, $1,200 a month, multiply that by 12 and you get the annual cost of living, which is $14,400. $14,400, what is the cost of living where you are? $14,400. Now, let's be real. I'm paying significantly more than that. I'm probably paying $2,500 a month. I'm probably paying twice that much. I live in a luxury apartment. I eat whatever I want. I travel where I want to go. Um, and I have the money to support it, so I don't feel bad about it. But your cost of living is going to vary based on what you want to do and what you prioritize. But the average cost of living is $14,400 a month. Oh, sorry, $14,400 a year. So multiply that by 25 to figure out what your fire number would be if you live in Mexico City, and that is $360,000. You could retire if you have in Mexico City for the rest of your life if you have $360,000 saved. That's a lot of money. But if you think about what it would cost to retire in the US, to retire early in the US, what that number would be in the US, it's going to be significantly higher between the expenses of insurance in the US and the skyrocketing cost of living in the US, it's going to be a lot higher in most US cities. And so one of the messages I have for people is that if you want to retire early, being open to retiring outside of the US really helps you because if you're getting a pension, if you're getting any kind of retirement income, you don't even have to have that 360 save. It could be a different number. Um, now you might need more money on the front end if you're not getting that income yet and you're getting it later. Um, but you can work all of that out. But it's very important to keep in mind that when we think about how we handle retirement in the US, you start working at 18. I started working when I was 12, which is why retiring early was definitely my goal. I started working, I've had a job and been in school or worked full time every day of my life since I was 12, except for two six month periods. And then when I retired early, um, 12. So, uh, and I know a lot of other black women, this is their story too. We've been working forever and we are tired. So if you are tired, look at the cost of living in other cities, check out fire and see what it would take. Check out, do the math, figure out what it would take to retire in a city that you actually want to be in, that you dream of. Like, do you want to be in Cartagena, Colombia, living your best life? Do you want to be in Paris? I don't know what the Paris numbers are. They might be higher than your US city, I don't know. But it's worth checking out, do the research. A lot of things in France are gonna be cheaper, like the healthcare system if you get residency. Um, all of those things are things you need to look into when you think about retirement. Don't limit yourself to the idea that you, like I said, I think I got off topic of this one, but if you start working at 12 and then you work to like, I think my mom worked till she was six, 70, 68. She still does some work. Um, but people work until they drop dead at their desk. They work until they're too old to enjoy life. And so the idea that you can become financially independent and retire early, especially if you do it outside of the United States, is a really great way to reclaim your time. I'm 41, I do not have to work anymore. I do some work. I coach women who wanna take sabbaticals and gap years, but I do it because I enjoy it. And so if you want to retire early, like I said, do not sleep on the idea that you can hit your goal a lot earlier if you focus on getting out of the US. You probably don't even wanna be there anyway, do ya? The US is not your dream, is it? It's not. So definitely my advice to you is check it into the FIRE movement look at what the numbers you need to hit are to feel comfortable look outside of the us check out apps like the earth awaits.com i'm sorry websites like the earth awaits.com for information about how to calculate cost of living they'll do that for you and then you can use those cost of living calculators to figure out fire numbers in other countries and you can do it
If I can retire early accidentally, you can retire early on purpose. So go ahead, make your plan, get out of the US, get out of the US, get out of the US. And um, I wish you the best. If this video helped you, go ahead and press the subscribe button. My next video is going to be about what you need to do in 2021 to live your best financial life. So hit the subscribe button, hit notifications, and you will not miss out. Uh, tell me in the comments where you would go if you were going to retire early outside of the US, because I definitely want to hear about it. So I hope you're having a great day, and I will talk to you next time.